we'll go ahead and get going then. Uh, we've got two speakers today. The common topic is uh, reintroduction efforts of Corregonis, Arteti, Cisco, and Saginaw Bay, Lake Huron. Uh, we've got two speakers. Each of them have about a 15 minute uh, time block. And we're gonna, uh, the first will be Kevin McDonald, followed up by Dave Fielder. Uh, and then we'll, we'll hold for questions until after both presentations. Uh, and, and we do have some time. Uh, one of the great things about this webinar has been a good opportunity to have discussion and questions at the end of this. So we're hoping for that again today. Um, you know, we have at least until 1.30 and if the conversation is still going strong, we can kind of check in and see how much longer we wanna continue the, the discussion if it's happening. So I'm gonna just give some brief introductions to Kevin and to Dave. Um, Kevin got his bachelor's in science in wildlife ecology at University of, thanks Jason, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, then he got his master's at, in fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State. Uh, and then he went out west and got his PhD in fisheries and wildlife at Oregon State University. And along the way, he also got a master's in statistics out there at Oregon State University. Uh, he came back to Michigan in 2020. I don't know if that was just a little bit before COVID or if you've been completely just working from home, Kevin, but started at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Wildlife Conservation Office in Alpena uh, in 2020. So welcome to Kevin. Um, Dave Fielder, I think, is, uh, has been around uh, longer and maybe more of a familiar face to, to many of us. Uh, Dave got his bachelor's in science from uh, in ecosystem biology at Eastern Michigan University, got his master's in natural resources at the University of Michigan, and uh, got his PhD in fisheries and wildlife at Michigan State. Uh, he's been with Michigan DNR since 1994, that's 27 years by my math. And then uh, he has eight years before that with South Dakota Game, Fish and Parks. Um, so we're really pleased to have both of these gentlemen, both happen to be working, at least their offices are in Alpena, so some nice synergies there. And with that, I'll take it away, Kevin. Thanks so much for the introduction, Bo, and uh, just thanks to everyone for, for making it out today uh, to hear um, some information about uh, our, our efforts in Saginaw Bay and uh, Cisco reintroductions there. Um, so yeah, before I move forward uh, with, with, with my talk, um, I think some acknowledgements are in order. Um, that This was a truly a collaborative program that just wasn't, wouldn't be possible without everyone uh, that you see listed on, the, on this slide. And I'd especially like to, um, you know, thank uh, give a shout out to our hatchery programs and our hatchery staff. They are, you know, without them, none of this happens. Uh, they're the ones that are culturing the fish, you know, around the clock year long and helping us stock and uh, just truly appreciate their efforts uh, along with everyone else. Um, so just a little background first before we get going, uh, for those of you that may not be as familiar with Lake Huron. Um, so, so prior to the 20th century, uh, Cisco were the most we're technically the most abundant uh, pelagic fish in Lake Huron. Uh, in fact, there's a, this um, a quote here from 1929 that said, you know, they're found virtually out of every point in Lake Huron from the North Channel and Georgian Bay. Uh, and so, but uh, historically there, the spawning, excuse me, aggregations were um, concentrated in like several hot spots around the lake. Uh, and those include uh, Thunder Bay, uh, kind of northern Lake Huron, which includes uh, Drummond Island and uh, the Lachino Island complex, uh, the North Channel, uh, the Bruce Peninsula there, and then as well as Saginaw Bay, which is going to be kind of the focus of our, of our talk is um, uh, that, that habitat and that location. So as I mentioned, you know, they're, they're this really big fishery, big component, um, but however, uh, between 1940 and 1970, Cisco suffered a pretty severe decline. Uh, from being the most abundant pelagic fish to becoming almost just a minor component of the Lake Huron fish community. And so there were several causes for this, uh, including, you know, uh, ale life and rainbow smell uh, competition and predation, uh, overfishing, and then just habitat loss and eutrophication issues. Uh, and just since about the 1960s, you know, harvest levels have been, you know, less than uh, 100,000 pounds. And 
on this figure on the left side of the slide, you can see um, I, I broke out uh, the lakewide total of commercial landings of, of Cisco. And then I broke out uh, Saginaw Bay here. And you can see that Saginaw Bay really was the hotspot for this fishery uh, prior to the collapse and uh, really dominated or uh, composed most of the fishery uh, there. So that was kind of in the past, you know, where, where do things sit now? Um, so uh, the current distribution of, of Cisco and Lake Huron is really limited uh, to uh, the uh, Northern Lake Huron, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Le Chino, Drummond Island area, the North Channel and Georgian Bay. And as you can see uh, from this figure, uh, based on uh, USGS's uh, prey fish surveys, uh, there's almost no density of fish in the main basin of uh, Lake Huron or Saginaw Bay uh, to speak of. So, you know, that, that's kind of a, became an issue. Uh, and, you know, why, why would we want to rehabilitate Cisco in, in this lake? Uh, and so there, there's several reasons here. Um, for one, you know, just rehabilitating the commercial and recreational fisheries, uh, providing additional prey species uh, for, in, within Lake Huron for uh, predator species. Um, also, you know, Cisco are typically a low, a good prey base, uh, low in uh, thymonase. Uh, within um, Saginaw Bay, especially, they can provide a buffer for yellow perch uh, with, with predation buffer. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they're really good at connecting both the uh, near shore and offshore food webs uh, due to their migratory uh, spawning patterns. And uh, kind of the, and current, the current uh, trophic level in uh, Lake Huron is now starting to more resemble uh, that found in Lake Superior, uh, where Cisco are thriving there. So uh, conditions are potentially ripe for Cisco to get a foothold back in uh, the main uh, basin of Lake Huron. And then also, uh, you know, recovering Cisco and Lake Huron would also help meet a fish community objective that was identified by the Lake Huron Committee um, and in terms of uh, restoring that, that population. That is a, a key component that they have listed um, in that fish community objective. So the first question then is if, if we are going to re, uh, reintroduce Cisco to the main basin is um, to determine what kind of Cisco to um, to reintroduce. And so uh, here in this, this little simple graphic, you know, the, the, it really came down to do we reintroduce the shallow spawning form or a deep water form that is typically more associated with uh, Lake Superior. Uh, and so, you know, the shallow water form spawning and, you know, 10 meters or less, and then the deep water form spawning uh, between, you know, 30 and 20 meters or so. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the, the Lake Huron uh, Committee, uh, through the Technical Fisheries Committee, um, or uh, yeah, uh, decided to go with the, the near, the shallow form. Uh, and that was typically because uh, one, it's just one less factor to, to, um, to uh, track during the reintroduction process rather than stocking two forms, just stocking one. And then also uh, the, the shallow form is already present in Lake Huron. So uh, we are not introducing genetics from another basin in, into the lake. So we decided to go with the um, the, um, the near the shallow water form found in northern Lake Huron, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, and so uh, those broodstock were uh, developed from, or we developed broodstock from the, from those locations. Uh, and so essentially, we we went up to Lachino Islands and Drummond Island, uh, set gill nets, and collected those broodstock. Those broodstock were then uh, taken to uh, Jordan River National Fish Hatchery and were cultured there. Uh, and then eventually those fish were, are now being stocked into, or those fish are being used to derive a brood stock that are then being um, stocked into Saginaw Bay. Uh, and so yeah, Saginaw Bay was identified as the stocking location because it, you know, it is a historic nursery site and it's really the gateway into the main basin. Um, you know, we, we do anticipate that these fish are going to leave the basin, go out or leave Saginaw Bay, you know, and then hopefully populate, you know, the main basin and then eventually, you know, also come back uh, to spawn and use that um, Saginaw Bay for its nursery habitat. And so using the brood, light, uh, brood sack that we are derived, uh, we have an annual target of stocking roughly a million fish, a uh, million fingerlings uh, annually uh, for 10 years. And um, that stocking strategy is also split between a spring and fall release strategy uh, to, to evaluate the, how you know, the different stacking strategies and different timings uh, may uh, evaluate uh, survival. 
So uh, brood sack collections, uh, they began in earnest in 2017. However, we did explore uh, the, the process in 2016. And here, uh, you know, on, on this map, you kind of see the locations uh, of by year where we did collect fish. And on the left side kind of shows uh, kind of the, the start and end of when stock or when we went out to collect that brood stock and then also the cumulative number of Cisco collected. And so we had a target of collecting roughly 100 pairs of fish each year. Uh, and as you can tell in you know, 2016, you know, we were out there for about a month uh, to get our 100 um, fish. And by, by you know, this last year uh, in 2020, we we're out there for just a week. We were able to really dial it in, get out there and get the, collect our gametes uh, and, and get off the water. But as I mentioned, uh, we are collecting these fish in shallow water. Uh, so all these collections happen in roughly five meters or less. Uh, they come in really shallow in these habitats. Uh, typically over kind of rocky, uh, rocky habitats at the interface between rocks and macrophytes is, is kind of where we targeted uh, our collections. And so with, with those collections, uh, we, we currently have four broodstock lines uh, at Jordan River that were used to uh, plant a uh, fish. Uh, and I should mention, you know, we are tracking the broodstock's genetics and, and identifying how those uh, genetics compare to wild fish and um, and uh, up in the same complex in Lachino Islands. And so here on these plots, on the left, we have a, a measure of heterozygosity, and on uh, the right, we have a measure of uh, inbreeding, uh, the inbreeding coefficient. And so the highlighted red uh, bars here are cohorts uh, from 2017 that are contributing to uh, the broodstocks. And then all the other ones are just extra samples from going back uh, to 20, 2006. Uh, from the same area. And you can, the takeaway message is that our, our broodstock has uh, similar estimates of heterozygosity and inbreeding coefficients um, compared to wild stock. So that, that's, that's good. It, it means that our, our current broodstocks are rep genetically representative of what we would observe in the wild as well. And so when you play all that out, we, we do have an effective population size, um, uh, well, you know, over 100 fish uh, in each line. Um, so the genotyping is still underway, uh, as, as with a lot of things, COVID kind of threw a wrench in our ability to uh, process genetic samples. So um, we do have more uh, genotyping to do to ensure that uh, some of the other cohorts that we brought into the broodstock line are falling uh, in line with uh, the data I'm showing here. But uh, because of that, uh, we actually paused gamete collections. We're not planning on doing any gamete collections um, this year. Uh, and that's going to be paused until 2023. Uh, and at that time, we'll reevaluate and determine if, if indeed we need to go and supplement the broodstock lines with additional genetics to maintain uh, an adequate level of diversity. So kind of, uh, you know, we, we, we've identified where we're getting the fish. We derived our broodstock lines. Now kind of where the rubber meets the road is, you know, actually putting these fish into Saginaw Bay. And as I mentioned, um, we, we're doing a fall and a spring release fish with, you know, the fall fish being larger than the spring fish um, just because they're getting stocked later. And then we also are implementing both offshore and uh, onshore uh, stocking strategies in, in each fall and spring event. And so um, the offshore stocking, um, every, so all the stockings happening in this, this um, yellow ellipses here I have on the, on the screen here. And so this is uh, just north of Whitestone Point and south of uh, North North Point, I believe. So uh, just kind of between uh, the mainland and Charity Islands. And so the offshore stocking is occurring at roughly seven kilometers offshore. Uh, and then the onshore is just uh, right on shore there. And so uh, our spring stocking, um, and oh, and I should mention, uh, you can see here, uh, all of our offshore stocking is happening through our stocking vessel, the, the Spencer Baird, uh, which is, Great vessel, uh, built pur purpose built for uh, for these kinds of projects. So that, that's been great to uh, have. Uh, so as you can see, in, in spring, our spring stockings typically happen around mid June. This is all kind of dependent on fish growth and hatchery capacity and water temps, and it really uh, is a big undertaking to get these fish uh, in the water. But uh, typically in the spring, uh, th this is a mid-June stocking with, and those fish have averaged across uh, each year, which I'll, I'll show in just a bit, uh, at about uh, 58 millimeters. And then fall is in, our fall stocking event happens in mid-October. And so those fish are, are quite a bit bigger, um, averaging roughly 90 millimeters or so. Um, now, 
as you can tell, you know, mid June and mid October, sometimes not the greatest time of the year to be out on the water. So they, you know, the, the strategy has required us to, as I've said, uh, called the weather, uh, have some, some weather induced flexibility uh, within our, our uh, planned uh, or, or yeah, planned stocking. So for instance, in 2021, uh, we had to do all of our spring stocking on shore due to some really strong um, uh, uh, winds that we were afraid we were gonna push fish uh, on shore and potentially strand them. And then uh, in fall 2020, we had the, kind of the opposite problem where the water was just, it was so rough that we had to do all of our stocking offshore, um, it just wasn't possible. But uh, in general, we, we are trying to you know, stick to half onshore, half offshore uh, in each fall and spring stocking event. But to date, this is uh, kind of how many fish we, we've been stocking. So uh, as I mentioned, 2017 was the first year that we went up and collected brood stock, uh, which meant that 2018 was the first year that we were actually able to stock fish. And so we've been stocking fish um, continuously since then. As you can tell, you know, there's there's a lot of learning. Uh, uh, you know, this is the first time our, our hatcheries uh, had been uh, rearing Cisco, um, to my knowledge, uh, or at least in, in recent history. Um, so there, there was a lot of obstacles to learn. And so, but I, I'm proud to say, you know, in 2021, we got it dialed in where uh, we were able to stock half a million fish in both the spring and fall. Um, and we're looking forward to being able to, uh, you know, start to recapture these fish. And uh, I, I do want to mention that uh, for to evaluate these fish, we are using OTC uh, with spring fish receiving a single mark and fall fish receiving a double mark. So if we do recapture fish, we can tease out you know exactly which cohort or which stocking strategy they came from. So that brings us to then how are we evaluating uh, these fish now that they're in the water? They've been going in since 2018. Uh, what are we doing to to actually determine if the stocking is happening? And so uh, we're using uh, a variety of methods uh, that range from almost the entire uh, life history of a Cisco. And so it begins uh, in, in every year, uh, we'll be uh, about, or monitoring early life history. Uh, so, that, that, so that's the larval stage uh, roughly. And so that begins kind of right at ice out as soon as we get on the water uh, into May. Um, and we're using a stratified random or random stratified uh, sampling design, which this is one year of, of sample points you can tell. Uh, so quite a bit of sampling. Um, and so this is the idea here is we're looking for uh, larval Cisco to document any recruitment that is occurring in Saginaw Bay from these stocked fish. So uh, so the 2018 year class was was should now be at spawning age. And so this 2021 might be the first year that we document successful spawning in Saginaw Bay. Uh, unfortunately, our larval pitches weren't super high this year, but um, we're getting those uh, larvae genetically identified. And um, uh, hopefully over the winter, we'll, we'll be, able, be able to confirm that. So after kind of the larval stage, we move into June, July, and that, that sampling is focused on juveniles. Uh, and we do that through uh, three methods. We use a beach saning, a small boat, a shallow water bottom trawl, as well as a small mesh gill net. And then uh, adults are sampled kind of throughout the summer from July to September through a, a lot of our partners' um, efforts, uh, including midwater trawls, uh, bottom trawls, and then Michigan DNR's uh, community gill net surveys and lake trout surveys. And then lastly, to kind of close up the life cycle of, of a Cisco, we, do, we are gonna start uh, spawning surveys, which are occurring in November. And so this year will be actually be the first year that we will be implementing the survey. Uh, and so the plan here is to start our gill netting um, uh, right at the stocking location and hopefully in hopes that these fish are, will um, display some sort of site fidelity uh, and we'll be able to capture them. So kind of results to date, uh, as I mentioned, um, we, did, we don't have a, a ton of results uh, quite yet, but uh, this year we did get our first hatchery recapture. Uh, so we caught a single fish uh, in a small mesh gill net survey at the end of June. It was an immature male. Uh, we caught it kind of at this location, just south of Point Lookout here in Saginaw Bay. And it did have OTC marks. Uh, and we were able to confirm that it was a false stocked fish. So the, that was a great uh, proof of concept in terms of the OTC marking and you know ensuring that uh, those marks uh, persevere uh, in the wild. Uh, however, we have not had any other recaptures to date uh, in, in any of our juvenile sampling gear. 
Um, especially this last year, it, it really seemed like the, the fish moved offshore rather quickly. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's really hard to get the timing down, which is also why we're implementing so many um, survey designs or survey methods uh, to, to evaluate these fish. And uh, just real quick, I just wanna point out the importance of, you know, just this continued monitoring through time. Um, so Great Lakes Cisco are kind of known to have inconsistent recruitment. And here on this figure, uh, this is from Myers uh, et al. Uh, and here I've just pulled out just the Great Lakes fish. And so this is just year class data, uh, densities, uh, densities of different year classes throughout the Great Lakes. And what the takeaway here is, you know, they have really spotty uh, recruitment. And so a single large year class has the potential to carry a population for, for a while. So uh, I mentioned that this, this project is, is slated to continue through 2028. And I, that, that continued amount of stocking is gonna be really important. Hopefully get the stars to align where we can pull off a really good year class uh, that may have propelled the, the fish or this population to being more self-sustaining. And so uh, just kind of wrapping up, looking forward, um, so post-stocking survival remains a really big question. Uh, the question of, you know, where did the fish go? Uh, we currently are working with USGS on a telemetry product uh, with uh, those fancy predation tags um, that can actually let us know when a fish gets eaten. Um, and so that, that actually just got off the ground this last year. Uh, hopefully we'll have some results uh, in to give us information about uh, predation after stocking as well as dispersal. And then there's obviously more work to be done with our root stock genetics and morphometrics. Uh, our, our collections of, of gametes up in the uh, Lishno and Drummond Island have really focused on early run shallow spawning fish. Um, you know, and so we're hoping to maybe do additional work to evaluate if additional spawning strategies are, exist up there that we're just not capturing in our broodstock. And uh, just kind of, you know, we're really looking forward to our uh, adult spawning survey this year. I, I think that is, you know, we're just kind of waiting on water temps, but uh, the crew will be getting out in the next week or two to hopefully go find some spawning adults uh, in Saginaw Bay, which would be really, really exciting. And then also just kind of as a transition into what Dave uh, is going to be talking about, you know, there's always more work to be done on evaluating other factors, uh, you know, uh, that are affecting survival and recruitment of Cisco and identifying what those factors are uh, from the outset uh, would definitely be helpful in determining uh, more, more successful stocking strategies and also monitoring strategies. But that's kind of the 10,000 uh, foot view of our program and what we've been doing. And with that, I will pass it off to Dave. Okay. Are you seeing my uh, presentation screen all right? Yep, looks good, Dave. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Bo, and the, and the lead in. Um, Kevin, this is uh, some analysis that I've been working on to try to identify exactly what variables are going to uh, govern whether or not this reintroduction is a success or a failure and what the thresholds might be for those different um, values. And my co-author on this is Chris Olds, who's now with the USDA, <clears throat> trying to get Kevin to join on this, and he may or may not, we'll see. Um, So before this was implemented, there was lots of conversations about different uncertainties. And these were based on conversations that we participated in or overheard, overheard from the managers and decision makers. For example, simply how many fingerlings would have to be stocked in order to try to be successful? Um, what if hatchery fish imprint poorly and they can't find each other as mature adults? What if egg incubation or hatch is poor due to environmental conditions in outer Saginaw Bay? What if predation is high on juveniles with all the walleyes we have in the bay? What if overall survival is low of adults? Will wild fish be able to find each other and spawn? In other words, imprint. So in other words, how likely is 10 years of stocking to really result in a self-sustaining and expanding population? <clears throat> so to try to help answer that, thought about really the, the factors affecting this population, different sort of life cycle stages and dissected that down into sort of this flow chart here. And so the first input obviously is the number stock. That's pretty obvious. And whenever I have a yellow line around something here, that means there's a value or a rate that can be applied to, to uh, this population structure. So 
There's some survival rate of those that then go on to become H1s, a survival rate of juveniles that go on to become H2s, then essentially an adult survival rate that goes on to become threes and older. That's really when we think that uh, females would mature. And then the number of viable eggs produced would be their fecundity, with the half in there is to simply reduce it down to females. And then whatever percent of the stock fish actually imprint and can find each other again. Then there's some sort of hatching rate that will produce larvae or fry. Now the survival rate of there is to come back around to that mid-summer fingerling stage. And then ultimately a survival rate back, which is probably the same approximately as what the stock survival rate would be to become age ones. And of course, there's the spring and the fall fingerlings, and likely they have a different survival rate uh, from the stocking. We're not distinguishing between that so far right now as our attempt is, is <laughs> enough just to try to get these factors isolated. And then lastly, there's a percent wild imprint that might be different than the hatchery imprint rate. Now, Cisco are notorious for having highly variable recruitment events, sort of a boom and bust where they have uh, one year out of so many where they have a very strong year class and then little or nothing in between. So in an attempt to understand that, they have a second model version that incorporates the tasticity around recruitment events, where the survival rate between fry and that midsummer fingerlings uh, stage would be something greater. And we trialed at 25% survival rate, a 50% survival rate, and then ask what's the minimum that could be and still have a increasing slope in the population. And we trialed that for one out of every four years and one out of every seven years, ran it a thousand times each in order to try to understand that. So we have really kind of two models, sort of a, a simple deterministic one and then the stochastic one. And this was all organized in a Lefkovich stage class model, it's a matrix model, very similar to the more familiar Leslie matrix model, where you have survival rates for different life stages going down the, the uh, diagonal. You have the fertility rates, which in our case is the fecundity rate across the top. And that's multiplied times your initial number, which for us is the stocking number. And then you play this out however many years you want in to create a projection. So the hard part, of course, is putting rates to all this. Um, the number of stock, the million is the target. Um, that's kind of a given, so that's pretty easy. Uh, the percent of stock fish that successfully imprints for Cisco, well, we don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of measures on that for Chinook salmon, so we can maybe borrow that rate as a starting point at 58.4%. What's the percent of wild that successfully imprints? Well, we don't know that either. Although there's been some similar work done with corgonids that have borrowed certain metrics from cutthroat trout. So that's what we did as well at 65%. Now, what is the percent hatch of eggs in the wild? Well, there are some actual measurements of that dating all the way back to Van Osten and more modern estimates. Uh, ranging between 13 and 26.8%. A lot of those come from, say, Lake Superior, for example. Um, I hypothesize that in our egg predator rich environment in Saginaw Bay, it's probably lower. So we start that off at 5% instead. And then we have the survival rate of fry to summer fingerlings and summer fingerlings to age ones. We don't know what that is exactly, but there are estimates of survival for the first year from fry to age ones from Lake Superior. So by expressing that linearly and then calculating a daily rate and applying that to the segments of the year, we can come up with these rates here of 6.11% and 5.56%. Well, jumping down to the adult survival rate, lots of measurements of that. We pick 70% as sort of an intermediate value and then hypothesize that the juvenile age one to two would be less than that, but more than the fry to fingerling survival. Uh, life stage, so assign that at 30%. And then the fecundity, uh, we have actual measurements from that, from the broodstock collections that Kevin described at this number here, but there is an, another estimate from the literature that's greater that we can evaluate. And then we have certain assumptions here about sex ratio and, and age of maturity. So this is what's going into the model to make projection. And our study sign, design essentially was to um, see what the uh, long-term trajectory was of this population 
uh, inputs using the dominant eigenvalue or the, the lambda 30 to tell us what the, the ultimate trajectory is. So if it's bigger than one, then it's going to be an expanding population. If it's less than one, then the population is continuing to shrink. Um, we vary one life stage at a time to try to isolate the thresholds and then perform sensitivity analysis in the form of elasticities, which is essentially the percent contribution of each of the life stage to that long-term trajectory or the lambda 30. And then lastly, those stochastic projections to see what the effect of periodicity is on uh, recovery. So to give you a sense about what this might look like, this is the, the, the actual matrix up here. Uh, the fertility rates are zero for these these uh, inputs here that are life stages that are, are the juveniles. And then finally, we should start seeing the, the, um, the fecundity. And this is multiplied by the, uh, the number being stocked as the initial numbers. As this matrix is actually much larger, this number goes to zero after 10 years. Looking at it another way here on the bottom, we can see that, for example, the first three years, we just have stocked fish. But once they mature and start to reproduce, then we have a combination of ongoing stocking and their progeny. And then we also have reproduction ultimately after stocking stops, hopefully continue to grow the population. So what does all this look like? <clears throat> well, here's our initial baseline projection based on those input values I showed you. And I'll break this down first by the stocked fish is this orange line with the squares coming up. And then once stocking discontinues, of course, they, they begin to disappear through their annual mortality rate. The gray triangular line is their progeny. So this is the, the wild fish that stemmed from reproduction by the stocked fish. And then naturally that's gonna trail off as well because the stocking discontinues. The yellow line is reproduction from wild fish. So these are the, the true wild fish, F2, I guess, if you would, and how they continue to increase over time. The blue line is simply the total number. And we can see from this that the lambda, the terminal dominant eigenvalue, the lambda 30, is 1.018, which is this slope here, which says that if these values are right as an input, this population will continue to expand even after stocking is concluded. So then we ask the question, what if we reduce stocking by 90%? What if it was just 100,000 instead of one, uh, 1 million? And you can see right off that the, the curves and the shapes look exactly identical. Only the y-axis, the magnitude is much reduced and the lambda is still the same. So this tells us that the, the number being stocked really isn't a driver in terms of long-term success, but rather the magnitude of whatever recovery is achieved and essentially how fast it might be achieved. So let's look at the imprinting rate of stock fish. What if we set that down to just 5%? Well, we can see that the once stocking um, discontinues that the population trails off, the reproduction is very slow to come on as a consequence, um, but the, we see that the, the slope of the line and the lambda is unchanged. So this suggests that as long as some stock fish can find each other, the recovery will continue, although I'll bite much more slowly. So what about that fecundity? What if it's actually that much higher rate reported than the literature? <clears throat> if we put that in and keep everything else the same, we see that the recovery is a much steeper slope. They recover more quickly, a higher number uh, with a, a larger lambda value. So this is the, the survival rate of um, the uh, fry to the summer fingerling stage. And in this case, I solved for a lambda at one, what's the lowest level that it could go? It can only go down to 5%, so not a lot of leeway there. But if you were to increase it barely 1%, uh, it becomes a, a much steeper line. So this is a fairly sensitive uh, metric. Looking at the um, uh, uh, survival rate of the uh, fingerlings to uh, yearlings, it's something similar such that the uh, if we drop just one percentage rate in the survival, it becomes a declining slope. But if you were to double it, say to 10%, you can see you get an exponential increase. So this is, I'm, I'm skipping through, I'm not showing you every one of those, those uh, tests for threshold levels in the interest of time, but this is the elasticity analysis. So the higher the bar on the, the life stage, 
uh, the more effect it has on the terminal lambda. And because we project this out 30 years and essentially 30 ages, that's why we see all these, these other um, life stages or ages, if you will, on the right side of this graph. What we see are the, the early life histories, the ones that have the greatest effect on the uh, <clears throat> population trajectory. And that's probably as you'd expect, right? Uh, small improvements in survival of, of uh, eggs or hatching rate is gonna have a big effect. If we look at the top five and break it out, what we see is probably that the highest value here is the survival of summer fingerlings to the full age one. It seems to have the greatest effect. But that might be partly an artifact that this is a, a stocking model, if you will, and that's reflective of the, the, uh, the contribution of stock fish uh, in the overall trajectory of the population. So let's look now at those stochastic uh, predictions. This is using all those same baseline values that I showed you, except that the survival of fry to summer fingerlings is set at some higher value. And this is just one example, it's set here at 15%. And right off you see, you get this sort of, this peak and, and valley herky-jerky sort of pattern to the trajectory as you might expect. Now this isn't one year every four years of wood production. This is a 25% likelihood, a random draw from that distribution as to when strong recruitment events could be. So you could have two strong recruitment events next to each other, and then maybe several years of, of, of no recruitment or very low recruitment. And this is just one um, year, but I ran these a thousand times each. So let's look at what this looks like. In this case here, I'm, I'm trialing the 25% survival rate one out of four, so let's run the model. Right off, you can see, as is so often the case with these stochastic simulations, we're getting projections all over the map. Uh, some of them huge recruitment events, other ones almost flat lines. <laughs> and you start to think to yourself, how can we possibly um, interpret this? So the way we do that, of course, is to calculate the average. And in this case, we see what appears to be uh, a increasing population trajectory uh, with a one out of four year boom periodicity with a 25% survival rate of those dry or summer fingerlings. So this is sort of a summary of those. The top graph here is a one out of four. The bottom is one out of seven. And we trialed the 25%, 50%, and whatever the minimum was to get an increase in population. So for, for the one out of four, we see both 25 and 50 result in a increasing population. 17% technically wasn't increasing, although it almost looks like a stable population. Uh, for one out of seven years, if that's the true periodicity, then we see that even 25% would, would not sustain the population. It has to be a survival rate of the fry to summer fingerlings uh, at 33% or greater to result in a uh, expanding population. So we can summarize that by looking across those thousands of of projections that are behind each one of these, these lines and uh, looking not at the terminal lambda because these, now at this point, these aren't increasing stable lines. These are all over the place. But I can look at the average over the last 10 years in the time sequence to see if it's greater than one or not. And when we do that, we can see that the recovery likelihood success of having a lambda of greater than one is somewhere between 75% up to 95%. So these are the same values I showed you before. And this is some arbitrary sort of assignment of sensitivity. The number of stock and the percent that successfully imprint that are stock fish really is not a driver of recovery. There's moderate sensitivity in the model to the percent of wild that successfully imprints, but there's, it, the model is very sensitive to the percent hatch of eggs and the fry to summer fingerling uh, survival. It's, sensitive to the periodicity and those for our survival rates. It's very sensitive to the summer fingerling to age one survival rate. The adult survival rate I characterize as compensating. I didn't have time to show you that, but one of the things that we observed was if you could increase the adult survival rate to something higher, so 80%, 85%, it allowed those minimum thresholds to be lower at these other, for many of these other uh, particular rates. And then lastly, the fecundity itself, uh, it was moderately sensitive to that. So the joint probability of an egg reaching adulthood in the wild is 0.004%. 
the prob joint probability of a stock fingerling reaching adulthood is 1.17%. So by stocking, we have a hatchery compensation of about 327 times. So we conclude from this that these rates are conservative generally and that Cisco recovery from reintroduction stocking and Central Lake Huron has a reasonable probability of success. Our data says 75 to 95% likelihood. So here's a few just summary takeaway points. Uh, the projections proved sensitive to all inputs affected survival rates, not really surprising. The most sensitive were to the early life stages like eggs and larvae. Cisco reproduction is strongly affected by the periodicity of recruitment events. Um, the uh, imprint in a stock Cisco is not a determinant factor as long as there is some, but in reality, that's probably more important in the real world than our numbers suggest. Uh, the number of stock is also not a determinant value, but again, it's probably more relevant in the real world. But one point of this is that if we want to maximize our chances for success, rather than stocking more Cisco, we probably need to stock more years. That's one thing we have some control over. And higher survival of adults allows for lower survival in juveniles. So that might mean maybe there's some room for management by uh, limiting or restricting harvest during the recovery period so that we might promote uh, success. So a number of different acknowledgements and um, I'll hope we have, I guess we have time for questions. Great, thanks very much, Dave and Kevin before that. Kevin, for the nice overview of the introduction program and the evaluation component that's been underway and going to be ramping up even more with targeting multiple life stages. And Dave, what I think is a really interesting and important um, <clears throat> analysis simulation that gives us some hope, uh, some really good hope, I think, of success, sort of showing what key life stages are going to be most critical um, for success. So, um, you know, we're first, first fish went in in 2018, I think, we're now in 2021. Already a couple of recaptures, Dave, I saw that you maybe just reiterate what you said in terms of adding another potential recapture. I saw that in the comment. Uh, it, it, we had a, a Outer Bay uh, station in our fish community survey that we caught a Cisco and we haven't had a chance yet to test for the OTC mark, but at least we got one. And uh, so then maybe there's two <laughs> now that we've seen, uh, in addition to what the Fish and Wildlife Service has collected. What size was that one? Do you recall? Well, it was about maybe uh, six inches or so. It was a jewel roll. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of good chat going on already. Um, uh, Ryan, uh, I don't know if Ryan, if you were from Maywash perhaps, but Ryan was indicating that in there are there is a population off of the Bruce Peninsula and the Fishing Island region. Uh, and some of those fish were um, included in a in, in press paper that Randy Eschenroder has looking at the morphology of different contemporary Cisco's across uh, Georgian Bay, North Channel, Northern Lake, <laughs> Northern Main Basin, and also this uh, these Maywash collections. Um, it's worth noting that obviously there are other sources of Cisco in Lake Charm, Georgian Bay, uh, the North Channel, uh, the St. Mary's River. Um, and when this was first talked about as a reintroductory effort, you know, there was, there was some question as to, well, maybe we just need to wait and these populations will expand and recolonize the main basin in places like Saginaw Bay, which historically was so super abundant with, with Cisco. Um, after several years, there was really no evidence of that. And I think that then the, the basis for the, deciding to move ahead was, you know, let's do what we can to jumpstart this and to really test the ability for these fish to, to make a go of it in this part of the lake. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that background, uh, Dave. I, I wasn't there when they, those decisions were made. So, uh, and I know there is a lot of a uh, lot of factors at play in terms of deciding what population to go get and where to put them. So. Well, well, back then too, we weren't sure how long of a window we'd have, whether or not alewives were going to come back or smelt become super abundant again. You know, we didn't know where we were in some uncharted territory. So there was some sense that we need to move quickly to maybe try to fill that niche uh, before non-natives could 
reoccupy it. You know, as it's played out, that doesn't seem like it's happening, the resurgence of airlines. So maybe we've got time, but I think that it's still a good move to, um, you know, conduct this as an experiment, if you want to sort of adaptive management. So while people are sort of thinking about what questions to ask Dave and Kevin, you can just uh, use the raise your hand feature if you figured that out, or you can just sort of pop on your camera and we'll sort of get the, get the clue. Uh, we'll comment it's from Eugene Cow. He's noting he's finishing up some analysis of some historical catches, some fishery independent catches, and they're from Saginaw Bay. They include some Saginaw Bay work uh, in sort of the mid 1950s, and the, the highest densities were sort of in the southern outer bay region, the southern region of the bay. And he was just remembering that work and then looking at your map, Kevin, of where the stocking is occurring. And just you all had some discussion about how those stocking, both the sort of onshore and offshore stocking sites were, were chosen. And you provided an answer there. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to what Kevin put in the chat. But if you do, feel free to to chime in on that question. Yeah, that's another thing, you know, those decisions were made uh, before before I was here, I kind of inherited this. So um, I, I know that there was a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion before beforehand. Um, well, we, you know, Saginaw Bay is pretty predator heavy right now with the, the walleye recovery. And so there was lots of conversation about whether Saginaw Bay is even the right place or not. But likely Saginaw Bay served as a spawning and nursery ground for offshore pelagic Cisco. So it seemed to, to make sense to reintroduce them as juveniles where they where their nursery habitat originally was. And you know historically there was an abundant walleye population there as well. So Cisco must have some ability to evade predators. Uh, so it ultimately is decided to um, try to match them to those habitat types rather than to try to emphasize predator avoidance. Okay. Sure. And while we have oh, Thomas has popped on his camera there. Oh, go for it. Oh, but yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. And then I, I just thought I'd also make a make a plug. Um, you may see these signs uh, at boat launches throughout Southern Lake Huron uh, in the in the main basin. Um, and if you are collecting fish, so I, I'm interested in those fish that Ryan uh, been collecting. Um, we be we are willing to process them for OTC to confirm uh, if they are indeed stocked Cisco. So, uh, if if you are collecting fish, uh, by all means, get a hold of me uh, or 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 Dave or anyone working on the project, or just send us some some frozen tails, and uh, we'll we'll do the rest. But uh, just a quick plug. But great. Um, I see a question here in the chat. Um, let me get to that. Uh, Thomas, are you going to get a question? Okay, let me just do this chat one. This is from Ben Rook. Any acoustic tagging or marker capture studies looking at migratory behavior of the source populations that will be up in the northern Lake Chino Islands? Uh, I know about um, some work that Todd Hayden, Chris Holbrook are doing. There's a, they are tagging adults up there in northern Lake Huron. Um, that work is like towards the end of this. I don't know if we have anybody from that project on this call that wants to chime in and describe what they found. I know they've also increased the uh, density and coverage of their um, receivers to try to get more information about their offshore movements. Um, let me just pause there. Chris, you're on, perfect. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just real briefly, I mean, Todd's given several presentations on uh, sort of results to date, um, sort of a formal analysis to meet the objectives probably won't be completed until this winter. And the last round of tags is going out um, this fall in the next couple of weeks, uh, hopefully. Next week, um, when they're going out. Next week, yeah, it's do yeah. or die, right? For the, yep. <laughs> for the group. Um, at this stage, so let's hope the water cools down. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but the bottom line, I guess, uh, probably safe to say at this point that, um, um, you know, the, the receivers that were out there for the last couple of years were covering, I, I probably have these numbers wrong, but I think out to about 
uh, 300 feet deep, roughly, you know, give or take 50 or so. <laughs> um, so it was a pretty much a uniform grid from uh, from sort of inshore habitats where, where those fish are spawning uh, out into the edges of sort of main basin habitat there in the northern part of the lake. And um, uh, um, I'm not going to say how many fish or anything like that, but but the general trend is that they stay pretty close inshore uh, most of the year, but do move into the that offshore water, um, you know, in in the summer months, particularly the late summer months when it's warmer. So there is some 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 offshore movement occurring, and uh, hopefully the, in the future here, the next few months we'll have more information about how many fish are making those movements, um, you know, and what what habitat in terms of depth and temperature they're they're using. Um, throughout the year, including those, those summer months when they're offshore. And then kind of as a follow-up, Chris, I don't know if you can take this one, but there's a pilot study actually tagging fish in Saginaw Bay, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. So there were uh, 26. So it is a pilot study and they're the, these are juvenile Cisco that Kevin talked about from Jordan River being stalked into at the same release site there um, in Saginaw Bay. Uh, it's just 26 fish, but it's a pilot study. There's a grid covering, I think, about four square kilometers or so of near shore habitat. And they also had a slocum glider out doing some experimental work to try to detect some of those fish as well. Um, the data were just recovered a couple of days ago. Yeah, here you go. That's a good idea. It's just, I'm not sure who's presenting this, but maybe Kevin. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kevin. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can see on the right, there's the, I don't think that's the receiver array that we ended up going with, but it's, okay. it's, it's roughly in that same sort of size and area. Um, and so those, those, um, those fish were released in early October and the tags and the receiver, the tags, probably died within the last week or two and, and the receivers were pulled. So the, uh, the object there is the, the goal of that work is to basically look at um, how many of those fish are moving outside of that region, whether they're dis when they're dispersing away from the release site, um, as well as when they get eaten by a predator. So those tags each have uh, a small uh, acid sensitive um, uh, component that when they, when they get eaten by a fish or a bird predator, um, they will they will essentially start signaling that um, and give us a, a way to estimate the time that the predation occurred. And then hopefully um, with the receiver as well, the location where that occurred. Uh, so this, this study really looking at post, post stalking mortality and dispersal away from, from the stalking site. And those receivers, like I said, were just pulled out of the water, I think, earlier this week. So um, I'm sure uh, Todd is probably right now trying to trying to take care of the data and make some sense out of it. <laughs> so. Okay. Thanks for jumping on, Chris. Thanks yeah, you calling. bet. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here. All right, let's go to Thomas. Got a question? Yeah, so actually I have two questions, but I'll just ask one and then I'll write one in the chat if you have time. Um, so the walleye Cisco connection seems to be um, interesting in, in Saginaw Bay, and it seems you know it seems to be one of the ways that y'all are motivating the whole stocking is to provide forage for walleye. But on the flip side, if if walleye eat a lot of Cisco, that could lead to poor survival from age zero, age one Cisco, which is a sensitive part of, of Dave's analysis. So that seems to be really important. And I guess what I was thinking about, we did some work in Saginaw Bay about 10 years ago and looked at walleye diets. And we also sampled fish at the time. Of, there were a lot of age zero whitefish in Saginaw Bay at that time, but we never saw any age zero whitefish in, in walleye stomachs. Um, and I don't know, um, you know, why that is. They're kind of, you know, age zero, young whitefish and young cisco are kind of similar. So I guess I'm just curious, is there any evidence that, that walleye in the system will feed on Cisco? Um, how confident are you that will happen? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the, the, the objective isn't to feed walleye necessarily. The, <clears throat> the objective, um, if there is a, a, a walleye component, is to provide a, a 
predation buffer that might benefit yellow perch. One of the phenomenons we've had in the bay since walleye recovered is that um, the mortality rates in young yellow perch are so high that it's really preventing recruitment and keeping that population suppressed. We hypothesize that missing is a linkage from main basin production of, of very abundant pelagic planktivores that in recent decades had been alewives and then historically was probably cisco. Um, not necessarily adult cisco, but maybe they're juveniles that use the bay for the first year as maybe a sort of a, um, a nursery grounds. Um, that might be what's missing and making the difference for perch. So, you know, that's something we have an eye to and a hope for, but that's not the sole motivation for this reintroduction in, in Saginaw Bay is to, to you know, feed uh, uh, walleye. It's really to reestablish Cisco, hopefully ultimately offshore in the main basin of Lake Huron with potential benefits for restoring that pelagic planktivore niche. Could have benefits for all certain for lake trout, but you know, maybe even Chinook, Chinook eat uh, Cisco up in Lake Superior, for example. But uh, Cisco and walleye are very common in the same system. You see those in inland lakes, they are a, a dietary component. But um, yeah, you know, they, these crickets must have some of a, uh, ability to evade predators as juveniles. I don't know if they're maybe occupying the near shore zone. Away, where, away from where some, you know, walleyes might be. Um, but, you know, I no doubt a lot of them get lost to predation, but if you can get that escapement uh, of some number, then you can get an increasing population trajectory. At least that's what the, the model showed. Okay. <clears throat> so, let's see if other hands come up. If not, maybe I'll ask another one. Uh, one of your findings, Dave, talked about, you know, the criticality of not only the early survival, but also that periodicity of recruitment. And so we've seen from Lake Superior how it tends to be, it can be decades or more before they get strong year classes. And, you know, whether that's, Ben Rook actually has some nice recent studies talking about um, whether that might have been the case historically, and if that's the case today, what level, what role productivity may play. And it just got me thinking about where Cisco seemed to be most abundant up there in northern Lake Huron, Lake Chino Islands region. Do we have any assessment data? And, and maybe if we do, it's from the tribes that would allow us to get at sort of what that age class distribution looks like to see, does it look like it's relatively continuous but low recruitment, or is it sort of you know, sporadic, like we're seeing more in, in Lake Superior. I've never really thought about that or seen data on that. Yeah, good question. Um, we we get a little bit in some of our assessment information in terms of wages, but not enough to answer that. I don't know yeah, if Kevin or maybe I, you know, okay. I actually have some data. So um, on the on this plot, we have a year class, uh, and then uh, just number of observations, and then agent capture. And you can see there's a couple of year classes. This is all from just our uh, GAMI collection gillnet surveys going back to 20, um, 2016. Uh, and a few a few other gillnet surveys uh, may probably mixed in there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like, you know, it's all or nothing necessarily um, uh, between year classes, but definitely some stronger performers, I think, of, you know, this 2014-15, which... I believe it was a really strong winter year. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. I, I wasn't... Record wasn't ice. Back. Yeah, I think that was okay. really cool. Yeah. Um, and then you see another big uh, kind of bump in this uh, was 2008-2010. Um, you know, um, and then, you know, it kind of tapers off, as you would expect, you know, um, fish to, to age out of, of the survey. So to, to some degree, like I said, you know, take these data with a grain of salt. This is a lot of uh, very targeted sampling, um, you know, on spawning fish and not necessarily uh, kind of a randomized um, trial by any means, but definitely a, a line of evidence to suggest that, you know, there are stronger year classes for sure um, and that it's not completely consistent. Yeah, wow. We didn't plan that. You had just had that ready. That's <laughs> really I, I was working on it. I, I <laughs> running over time in my presentation, so things had to get yeah. cut. Nice job. Um, I don't know if we have any tribal biologists with tribal data that have looked at this on the call or not. 
And we had Jason earlier. So that's kind of in the very early stages. We're working with Lake State on, on all this Cisco data from the last 30-ish years. I don't even have an ugly graph I could put up yet. Okay. Okay, good. Well, that's good to hear that's coming. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> um, we do have one more uh, note in the chat. Dave, maybe you've had a chance to read through what Thomas said about the potential for density dependent effects. Wasn't sure if you included that in your model and to what extent might that be important in different life stages? Well, that's a good question. And there is no density dependent feedback in these matrix models. And people often point to that as a deficiency or a shortcoming, and it certainly is. In our case, we're not really interested or concerned about what the ultimate density effects will be. We're really just interested in what's the trajectory in the early stages of recovery. And for that dimension, I don't think density is really kicking in yet. I mean, the, the capacity of Saginaw Bay for Cisco historically was probably in the tens of millions of fish. So you know, I don't think that's gonna really become limiting right away. So in terms of understanding the trajectory, I think these model, this model is adequate, but you're right. I mean, in terms of really scaling out a, a hundred years as to what might happen with that population, you know, that we, we don't have that element incorporated. I think if you had, if habitat, spawning habitat's limited, it could become, I agree, it's not gonna be an effect for when you're, when they're feeding, you know, that's not gonna be an issue, but there's, it's not, there are certain, there's all sorts of aspects of density dependence and there may be limited habitat or you may be attracting predators when you when you stalk a bunch of them or that they start targeting them that could really change the rates in your um, in your model. So it seems to me like it could be a, uh, an effect, just yeah, not in terms of, of prey for availability for Cisco. I completely agree with that. It's not going to be an issue, but, but other aspects of density dependence could be. Yeah, yeah. And, and really understanding the spawning habitat is something that, you know, we don't know a lot about for Cisco. I mean, we always think that it's like anything else, it's, you know, rocky substrate, but the work we did up in the St. Mary's River, for example, mapping that, um, you know, especially in a river situation with flows, a lot of times where they're spawning is not where their eggs settle out. And, and some of the hypothesized that, you know, really what's more important are congregations of schooling, mature fish that they, that, you know, I think I once heard Randy Eschenor say, you know, spawning habitat for Cisco is other Cisco. They, they swarm, they school up, and they spawn in mass, maybe almost indiscriminate in terms of what the, the bottom substrate is. So who knows? <laughs> I got to believe that Saginaw Bay has a, a fairly good diversity of, of habitat uh, for spawning fishes, but uh, it's all going to come down to whether or not these fish can find each other and they can uh, make use of it. And Dave, I think your your model has a, has a lot of opportunities to start to explore. Like, what when would we expect density dependence to kick in? So I, I've incorporated density dependence in, in matrix models um, in different ways in, in the past. And so, uh, you know, not necessarily that we think it's kicking in, but it, that's a fun question to ask: is how much habitat would we expect or to lose or gain to you know see density dependence move? you know, or, or affect the population at all. So I think that, that would be pretty fun to explore. Well, that's why you need to join the manuscript. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, just thinking about that spawning habitat, I know there's been some reef restoration or reef building work going on in Saginaw Bay, where I'm assuming there could be at least a potential to, to detect if Cisco are using that rockier Reef that's, a, that's a Corian reef down in the inner bay, and uh, that's a potential. Uh, that would be great to see. Uh, Thomas Hook has a grad student there doing a post construction evaluation, you know, sampling, and uh, no Cisco so far, is my understanding, but they're on the lookout for that. There's um, a fair amount of rocky reef habitat in the outer bay that still exists today, especially around the Charity Islands. You know, that whole Whitestone Point where they're, it's being, uh, they're being stocked is a fairly rocky area. So, you know, I gotta believe there's some good substrate there for incubation. Yeah, I, I haven't been out there with our USGS crew bottom trawling, but I know they've torn up a lot of nets in the outer bay. Yeah, <laughs> so easy to do.
Um, ben Rook also joins in, just adding to the comment I made referring to his paper when he looked historically at what what sort of recruitment must have had to have uh, must have had to have occurred in Lake Superior to support those massive catches, and uh, he's so he's just. Uh, clarifying that there was a sweet spot, I think, of the productivity that allowed perhaps a greater level of recruitment success historically. And then maybe, it, um, and then now he's thinking about, but there, there could be a point where too much productivity is bad, right? Yeah. Um, yeah but, you so, know, the Bay has a gradient of productivity from the eutrophic inner bay to almost oligotrophic by the time it reaches Lake Huron. And there's certainly a mesotrophic area in there. Hopefully they can, you know, find that sweet spot somewhere throughout the expanse of the bay. Hey, Yuchan, did you have a question? I see you popped your camera on. Yeah, I want to show the map. Uh, hopefully I can do it. So where is share? You, I don't know if Nick has to give you permission or not to share. Oh yeah, I can do it now, okay. So I want to show you the map. Uh, you have to zoom in a lot to see Saginaw Bay. So this is the prediction. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, we see it. Yep. yep. Kind of showing along that southern shore. Right, right. So I think uh, Dave, uh, yeah, good to see you, Dave. Uh, it is, uh, there's a gradient here. It's not here. Uh, so this map shows the predicted Cisco densities. Uh, in Saginaw Bay in fall, based on data collected in 1956. Uh, that's probably the last year we still have a very sizable Cisco catch in the bay. So you can see the gradient. That's ju not uh, just uh, inshore, oh, <coughs> sorry, inner bay and outer bay. There's also a north-south gradient. And uh, that uh, kind of puzzled us a lot. But if you go back to see the data, you did see, so it is not a, a modeling problem. You really, you can really see that in the data to show <clears throat> that data will show you there's a north-south gradient of Cisco density in GeoNet survey data. So I think it's very interesting. And we hope to submit the paper today. Um, Duchenne, was that spawning uh, Cisco? Thing? Right, that is in that is spawning Cisco, and they sampled in waters as shallow as three meters in depth. So this is based on uh, October and November data, because in other months they did not uh, catch Cisco in that year. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, just uh, let you know I. I don't know much about uh, the habitat in the 50s. Well, are we docking on the wrong side of the bay? Is that what that's telling us? That's what I was saying, but <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, one time we talked about splitting it between both sides and logistically we decided that wasn't realistic. Uh, hmm, interesting. I guess, um, yeah. I, you know, there is uh, the whole Goodyear reports and other uh, surveys of spawning fishes is being reported by commercial fishermen in the uh, early 20th century. And I thought they reported encountering Cisco just about everywhere. But um, maybe there's something unique about that. Uh, right, yeah, uh, because this is really a very unique year. That is the year where I should say these are the last Cisco in Saginaw Bay. So that's probably something special was there. And do you have a map of the sampling sites from that survey? Yeah, I do. That there was, to what extent there was coverage sort of along the northern shore? I don't remember those so details. So that's, uh, that's a coverage you can see. Yeah, so there's actually more on the northern side, yeah. Right, so but uh, these sites, these sites I, I pointed here have had the highest catch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. And what is that? So that's a really influential point. I'm just wondering: is 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 it such? A, is there other years of information at that site? Is that just one year of information? Is it an outlier, or yeah. is that a repeat? Yeah, we only uh, we unfortunately we only had one year of information. Although we have commercial catch data, but yeah, mm -hmm. that does not well. Corey may say about more about that, but yeah. 
we don't have, uh, currently we only have summaries that, uh, that did not include the uh, spatial resolution. So, but yeah, this tertiary independent survey, we only have one year. And then some of those dots would have been other seasons where no Cisco were caught too, right? So that's not just the fall. Your map oh, you showed before well, the well, fall. Well, in, in this year, this is more, they, they, the stations were consistent across seasons. Oh, I see. In second. Okay. Mm. Perfect, okay. All right, thanks, Eugene. Very relevant. Yeah, very cool. So uh, Tim O'Brien popped in with a comment uh, talking about the Cisco they collected from the USGS and Fish and Wildlife uh, Midwater Trawl Surveys in the fall and just indicated, talked about the age frequency distribution. And he says, we tend to see a range of size and age groups. So I'm inferring from that that there's no evidence of sort of uh, that there seems to be consistent recruitment and not maybe the um, highly variable recruitment that has been seen in Lake Superior over the last 20 or 30 years. Do I have that right, Tim? Is that what you're implying? Yeah, that's, that's good, Bo. I mean, certainly nothing here on proportions of age or anything, but at least gives us a sense that there's, we tend to see yeah. multiple, multiple age classes. Okay. Um, and then let's see, Ben asked a question. Uh, let's ask it to everybody. And again, if you've got to drop off, we still got 48 people, which is over, I think we got up to about 70. So, you know, obviously I'm going to keep going as long as Dave and Kevin are, are willing to. Um, ben asked, is anyone familiar with the currents and drift in the bay to comment on where larvae would end up? if they hatched along the south side of the shore or are there any, what do the prevailing currents look like within inner and outer bay? Uh, there are uh, flow and current models for Saginaw Bay. That could probably be investigated, but you know, the, the bay is pretty shallow and, and mixes and, uh, and it's really vulnerable to wind events such that um, it might be hard to predict, you know, I think they're going to disperse and, and move around and maybe unpredictable or different pattern by year. We're I just put a link into this. We looked, we did some work with some folks at Limnotech and did hydrodynamics modeling and looked at larval walleye transport in Saginaw Bay. And one of our release locations was on the southern, um, southern side of the bay. And we did it for two different years. In one year, they would have all shot out of the bay, because like Dave said, the prevailing wind conditions, and the other year they would have been uh, all retained within the bay. So it's, uh, I think I think what Dave said is right on, that it's so much, so dependent upon wind and what, what the wind's doing that year. Yuchen, you can stop sharing now too. Um, and then Corey is also listening. Corey's got an, uh, um, an interagency project that's looking at synthesizing historical data, especially at the spawning time. So going beyond Goodyear and Oregon and some of the other well-known <laughs> compilations. Um, and his comment is that, uh, well, at least I guess he's just summarizing Goodyear at this point. Um, much like what, I guess, I don't know if it was in Kevin's presentation. I think it was in Kevin's, basically the Celts, 1929, but they were everywhere within Saginaw Bay. Um, so whether or not the data that uh, Yuchin showed, which is sort of the last gasp of Cisco was um, because that's the best habitat or there was you know, maybe some stock structuring within Saginaw Bay we didn't understand. And that was the one stock that sort of was holding on. It's hard to know, I would say, but uh, definitely food for thought to thinking about stocking along the Southern shore and the Northern shore, if the logistics could be worked out. Yeah, and I know I mentioned in the chat that the, I believe there was, the, uh, we had a hard time finding a site that we could get the stocking truck close enough to water's edge, because uh, it's such a heavy, heavy vehicle. Um, and then, and have that site line up with somewhere where you could dump fish on what, you know, you would consider decent juvenile habitat. So. I think there was not that many sites that, you know, met all the criteria uh, in Saginaw Bay. But uh, again, I don't know how, 
how seriously they consider doing the, the southern uh, shore either. So. Okay. We may be hitting uh, an end point here. Let's give people one more chance. You want to ask a final question? Well, thanks everyone. This is a, again, really great participation, uh, especially on a Friday afternoon. Um, we look forward to next month's presentation. Uh, hopefully you were able to register from the link that Nick provided. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the tribal restoration efforts for whitefish. Um, might, I don't know what else, it's, it also is gonna include some talk on Cisco's and, and even some CAI work from Lake Superior, we'll see. Uh, and we'll get a, a talk title out to you relatively soon. So uh, everybody have a great weekend and thanks again for joining.